I'm excited to share Acts chapter 2 with you and what I see is going on there. Acts chapter 2 is a passage in the Bible that all of us know very well, especially if we are in the Pentecostal charismatic circles. We know the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, uh, praying in tongues, power, signs, wonders, miracles, the start of the church. And this is exactly what this passage is all about. It's about Jesus starting his church. Jesus calling people out of a certain people group and joining them into the joining them with the power of God. Now, Acts chapter 2 is a foundation for the rest of Acts. The way I see it is at Acts chapter 1 from verse 4 to about 9 is very very important and it serves almost as the cornerstone and then Acts chapter 2 as the foundation of what Luke is building. And that building that he's building is an argument wherein I believe he is explaining to Theophilus that the church is a peaceful people that doesn't have a political agenda. They're not trying to start a political party. They're not trying to be anything but the hands of God extended uh, to the people of of the world at that time they are basically now the body of christ the people to whom god has extended his hand and the people whom god has healed the people whom god has loved and this love that god has loved them with is now bringing forth a people that looks like jesus mentioned in Luke, the gospel of Luke, which is a peaceful people, which is a people that are that are willing to lay down their lives, a people that are not there to take up arms and start a revolt or a battle or any of those kind of things. I believe that is what's taking place here. So Acts chapter 1, and we're going to look at that again from verse 4 to um Eight, or we can say three to eight as a cornerstone and then Acts chapter two, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the uh, Peter explaining the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Peter going and explaining from passages in the Psalms that Jesus had to be raised from the dead and that it was prophesied him then uh, that message having a powerful effect on the people who crucified to Jesus and then the effect that the power of the resurrection had on them when they believed it and that's the four parts that I see of Acts chapter 2 so we're going to look at five parts today the uh, the part in Acts 1, again, we're going to recap on that, the cornerstone where Jesus is with infallible truth is seen as the resurrected Jesus, wherein the point is made that it is not about the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. It's actually the inauguration of God's kingdom in the earth. This whole thing about the kingdom being restored to Israel, that is over. Uh, it, it's about something much bigger. The kingdom to Israel was a type and a shadow. That is over. And we find that this is now something much bigger. It's not about a kingdom restored to Israel. We find that is the cornerstone. The resurrected Jesus saying then in Acts chapter 2, I am pouring out my life on those who believe upon me. And this is for all people. It is not for the restoration of of a certain kingdom so we have point one there the very important the cornerstone then four other points the outpouring of the spirit the explanation of the outpouring of the spirit the explanation of the resurrection the people believing in jesus repenting and the effect it has on their lives okay so first of all i want to start with uh by explaining what it would have meant to Theophilus when the Spirit was poured out. When Luke said to Theophilus, okay, this is the outpouring of the Spirit. When the day of Pentecost has fully come, the Spirit was poured out. What would that have meant for Theophilus socially and politically? Very important. Let's quickly go to Acts chapter 1 there. He writes to Theophilus, he says, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, his death, 
by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things as pertaining to the kingdom of God. So it says that Jesus, with infallible proofs, was raised from the dead. Very important. You can understand Acts if you if the focus is not the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, that was very important. Secondly, that. Um, he then spoke to them about the things of the kingdom of God. Now Theophilus would have heard, okay, this is about the kingdom. What does this kingdom mean? Then cleverly Luke writes in and he says that these people then um, were commanded by Jesus that they should go and wait in Jerusalem to receive the Holy Spirit. They then thought the people, the disciples, that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit could have meant the restoration of the kingdom back unto Israel. That's what it could have meant. But we find that Luke cleverly in the beginning of the passage sets Theophilus' mind at peace in telling him, listen, this is not, a, not another Maccabean revolt. This is not a Herodian pol political issue here. This is not the zealots thinking on how they can take up arms and overthrow the Roman government um, by the power of the Holy Spirit in some form or fashion to get the kingdom restored to Israel, which would simply mean to get Israel uh, independent of Rome. This is not what it is. This is not also the Pharisees and their effort to obey the laws so that God can restore the kingdom to Israel, get them free from Rome. This is not another false Jewish Messiah system wherein a man Jesus come to deliver Israel from Rome and give them freedom. That, this is not any of that. And that is said by the words of Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus said to them. You receive the Holy Spirit and they then asked Jesus, is this then the time when the kingdom will be restored to Israel? And Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come to you. So what he says is, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Now that's a very important passage to go and look at in Daniel. When it talks about times and seasons, we think of uh, just... Um, seed time and harvest time and those kind of things and sometimes you can think of the return of Jesus Christ and those kind of things but let us look at what Daniel chapter 2 says about times and seasons and what that means Daniel 2 and I'm going to read from verse uh, 20, it says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. And now it explains what it means when he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. Okay, so what he's saying here to them is, it is not for the church to know and to have their eyes on God appointing kings, and removing kings. Now when Theophilus would hear this, he would be at ease because he would know that the church is not about the ending of Rome's power. It's not about the overthrowing of governments. This is not a political movement. This is not what it is. When they thought it was a political movement and they thought the power of the Holy Spirit would then be unto the um, unto ending the political rule that uh, Rome had, that Herod had to a certain degree, um, Jesus corrected them and said, listen, this is not what it's about. You will receive the Holy Spirit, and that is all that you must be concerned about. You should not be concerned about when does Rome's rulership going to end? When is the oppression over the Jews going to end? You should not be concerned about that. It is not for you to know. And very interesting, I do believe that that is also the message that the church should have today. We are not a people group that tries to overthrow political powers. We are a people group that focuses 
on the Holy Spirit, which is the empowerment of God in our lives to love those around us, to see signs, wonders, and miracles, and have our lives overthrown by the power of the Holy Spirit into a people group that believes that Jesus is already Lord over all the earth and that we see no need to ever overthrow any of these things by political power. Should these things be overthrown? It should be overthrown from the inside, wherein the Holy Spirit has now grabbed a hold of the heart of a Caesar or a Herod or someone like that. That's how it's going to work. And I think that is what Acts chapter 1 is all about here. Many of you might not in, uh, uh, agree with my interpretation there, but I cannot see why Luke would have made it so important to start out the letter, the introduction, everything about this is, listen, Jesus was bodily raised, he's continuing his ministry, as he continues his ministry, he's got a kingdom that is not of this world. Should he have had a kingdom that is of this world, his disciples would have been fighting. This, These are things that is now already known to Theophilus. His kingdom is continuing. He's going to pour out his spirit. And then uh, this pouring out of the spirit does not pertain to the kingdom being restored to Israel. Okay, I have to explain what the kingdom being restored to Israel would mean in this writing to Theophilus. About 160 before Christ, there was 165 to 160 before Christ, there was what is called the Maccabean Revolt. I think it was 167 to 160 before Christ. There was the Maccabean Revolt. These were uh, a people that were standing up against the Hellenized state that Israel was under and the rulership they were under. Those people didn't treat Israel well. They stood up against the Hellenized state and they fought for their uh, liberty. They fought for freedom. They got their freedom. And for almost a hundred years, they were absolutely free to worship God and to govern themselves. That was what this was all about. Um, and they lived in their freedom. It was a good time for them to a certain degree. But then Rome came and Rome overthrew the whole Hellenized rulership. And all of a sudden, Israel was now under Roman power. And all of a sudden, they lost their power. And these Romans didn't like the Jewish religion. They were too full of pride. They were too full of themselves. And God is just theirs and all of that. They were a difficult people. And they also had power. So they had to keep an eye on them. And they were oppressing them. And as these Jews were now oppressed by the Romans through taxation and all those kind of things, and many other things that I'm not going to get into now, they wanted freedom. They were now waiting for a Messiah that could restore the kingdom again back unto them. And then they also believed that from that kingdom, they will then not just govern themselves, but that... God would govern the world through them as the law and their way of thinking and serving God in the right way then permeates the rest of the world. But the focus was firstly mainly on themselves. About 150 before Christ, people started to make what was called proselytes of non-Jewish people. They were getting the Gentiles to become Jews because they believed that is how God is going to do everything. And here the disciples after the resurrection is asking the question, is this the time for freedom from Rome? Is this what's going to take place? And then he says, listen, it is not for you to know God's placing and removing of kings and Caesars and any of that. It's not for the church to be even mindful of those things. You shall receive the Holy Spirit and what you shall be mindful of, you shall be a witness that I am the Lord, that I am the King. Now, do you know how much pain the church would have spared themselves should they have just yielded to that and understood it in its context? Today, and I mean, I don't want to get into uh, too much of a theology here and an application to the here and now. 
But I do believe that we can find so many of our ministries focused on prophetic words, on when will kingdoms come and when will kingdoms go, when is Israel going to be restored, when is presidents going to, what president is going to win, what president, which president will lose, uh, what's going to happen in the future, and we find books being written, ministry solely given to that, and we find that even on television, on uh, social media, people with a strong prophet or a so-called strong prophetic voice, all the time prophesying on what kings are going to be coming into power, what presidents will be in power, which ones will not be in power. Now, I believe that it saved the church a lot of pain in that time when they weren't mindful of those things. It saved them a lot of pain in this sense that they kept their eyes on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and declaring a man that could not even be seen then as Lord and Messiah. And then they had a life to prove his influence on them, which was a life of science, wonders and miracles and love. Now, that didn't um, bring them to a place where they had no pain at all, but the pain that came their way was not unnecessary pain. It was not pain because of um, political agendas. It was pain because of people simply hating God. Uh, and not wanting to see the rulership of Christ. I think it was also pain uh, in the lives uh, or pain that came their way because of a misunderstanding of what the church truly was. And I think as we are now, 2,000 years later, having all the knowledge about the Bible that we do have, and we have the history when we can see what takes place in history, uh, modern history as well as ancient history, we should now be at a place where we can say, we are not about what king or what president is going to be in power when. This is all about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, declaring Jesus as Lord and being a witness that Jesus was bodily raised. This is what it is all about. Okay, now we'll definitely go into more than one session. I'm just going to, the next five minutes, going to just look at Acts chapter 2. So, the point that I'm trying to make is, Acts chapter 2 is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. To Theophilus, outpouring of the Holy Spirit in his mind would mean this is now, I mean now, remember now, in the light of what chapter 1 says, when chapter 2 comes, this is now to Theophilus, okay, this is now what's going to take place by the power of God in the church which is then, because of this power that's coming over the church, going to be focused on testifying about Jesus' rule, his resurrection, and the newness of life he brings to them, saving them from sin and death. And this is now not going to be an empowerment to try and overthrow Rome or bring forth revolts and any of those kind of things. This is now the empowerment of something that's different to anything that we have seen. Okay, now it says, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they were, um, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire, and it sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then it goes on, if you go and read all of that, it goes on and it explains the different languages that was spoken. Now, what I see here is two things. I'm quickly going to touch on that. The day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, the word Pentecost, means 50. It's a Greek word for 50, which simply was talking about the uh, a certain feast that was kept, the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks was uh, seven weeks after the uh, Passover was uh, celebrated, where they celebrated freedom from the Egyptian oppression, and then for seven uh, seven times seven days, 49 days, and on the 50th day, they would celebrate this feast. This feast would be brought, would be uh, bringing two loaves, 
leavened loaves before God and two lambs. I believe what this means. I don't think this is what it would have meant to Theophilus, but what it, what it mean is uh, unleavened bread was eaten at the death of Jesus Christ, meaning I'm removing the doctrine uh, that people do believe. And I am re-leavening the doctrine and it will be two loaves, one for the Jews and one for the Gentiles, leavened by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, bringing a new doctrine which is for all people. There will be two lambs. It talks about the death that Jesus died for both Jew and Gentile, which I would find is the unification of Jew and Gentile in the death of Jesus Christ. And now it is the giving of the message that God has for them. Now, that would have meant to Theophilus that these, they are Old Testament passages and feasts that's now coming to a fulfillment here, which is in a way that basically ends all these old systems and brings something very fresh and new. It would help Theophilus to think that the Jews aren't only a bad people. They just want to overthrow governments. And it would also help him to think, and this is the point that I'm going to make, why I'm saying this. It would also help, him, help Theophilus to think that since the Jews has killed Jesus, we can maybe say that they've done wrong things, but the law that was given to them, the feast that was given to them, that is God speaking. So we cannot throw away the baby with the bathwater. We have to honor what God was saying all the time because we are now seeing the fulfillment of all of this. And all these feasts and all these things about the Jews in the past was actually not about excluding people. It was actually a message of including all people. This would bring a lot of peace to the heart of Theophilus in the state uh, or in the um, the the office of authority that he had what was also would be important and i'm ending off with this is that there was tongues as of fire now it is traditionally believed i don't say it is so but it's traditionally believed that the jews believe that on the this day of pentecost or 50 days after the exit out of um is out of Egypt. They received the law on Mount Sinai. And this law was then given uh, with a mountain that was smoking. There was fire and there was thunders uh, on this mountain. And that is when God gave the law. And Moses was up on the mountain and the people gathered at the base of the mountain and then he came down with a message. Now it is also, and you can go and study this out, that in Deuteron Deuteronomy 19, the word thunders there means voices. It means voices. So traditionalists also believe, the Jews, some of the rabbis believed, that the law was given in about 70 languages or 70 different voices. And there was fire on the mountain. And, to, and it is preached that this then meant that the new law was now given. I don't fully stand with that, but that is also what was given. I would think that Theophilus would have thought, well, uh, he had a mindset of God as a fire. And then all of a sudden this fire, which was to be said to be in the temple and the smoke that would come to the temple and all those kind of things is a message to Theophilus that, well, it's not about the temple anymore. It's not about the presence of God in the temple anymore. Uh, it's not about the law given there anymore. It is all of a sudden now about God coming to dwell on people. And the temple of God is now with man. And all the languages that is being spoken, it seems to me as if there's something happening that the God of Israel is not the God of Israel, but is the God of all people. I think that is what Acts is trying to communicate. This is what Luke is trying to to communicate. So let me wrap it all up. This whole message in chapter one and halfway through chapter two, we're still going to look at uh, what's what's happened in Joel two and then the resurrection, how that's explained. I think what is being communicated here is Jesus is king. 
He is Messiah. He is Lord. The Holy Spirit will be poured out not to overthrow other governments, but to declare the new government that there has already been given in the outpouring uh, of uh, or in the giving of Jesus, the ascension of Christ, and now the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It is not the overthrowing of another government. It is the declaration of the new government, which is over all and for all. It is a message which doesn't have a political fight in it. It is a message that has got the overthrowing of man's heart into a new belief wherein man's life can now be born from the power of God shown in Jesus Christ when he walked in the earth. This would have brought a lot of peace to, uh, to Theophilus. He would immediately have known that all the turmoil that there was around the church is not because of the church. That is not what the church believes in. They are not trying to fight Rome. They're not trying to fight the Herodians. They're not trying to be part of the zealots or any of that. These are genuinely true people of a kingdom that is not of this world, but coming into this world, which includes Jews and Gentiles, making everything new. He would have known that it's all about declaring this kingdom and experiencing the, the life that is of it, whilst honoring the kings of the earth of that time, whilst honoring Caesar, while not trying to dodge taxes and any of those things, this was a kingdom that is of heaven manifesting in earth. This would have brought peace to Theophilus. It would have brought him to a place where he knows, oh hallelujah, it's about a resurrected Jesus that has come to bring peace to the earth. And this, this just up to chapter 2 and verse 22 there would already bring Theophilus to a place of understanding and rest in his mind. I trust that this has helped you and um, I will then see you as we continue with Acts chapter 2 and we're going to look at what Joel meant and why Joel was quoted by Peter. See you next week.